It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Sunday, August 28th edition of the show. And it is 2022 College Football Week Zero Reaction and Recap. And I will go ahead and tell you, one, this is a lot later than it usually will be. Uh, We will be doing this at 9.30 a.m. Central Time, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Going forward, I've been out of town this weekend. I was at my in-laws, had some things to take care of, etc. But uh, but the show must go on. So here we are on Sunday evening, recapping everything that has happened in the world of college football. Lots to discuss. Before we begin, the college football picks contest, the Pick'em contest for Winning Cures Everything is now up. You can go over to winningcureseverything.com and make sure and enter there. There is a link on that page that will take you over to Run Your Pool. And that is who we are partnering with this season. The winner each week will get a $25 Amazon gift card and the winner for the full season. So that means, yes, go ahead and continue to enter each and every week. The winner for the full season uh, will get a prize to be determined within the next couple of weeks. So make sure that you are entering week in and week out so that you can build up those numbers. So go over to winningcureseverything.com, click on contest up at the top, and it'll be right there. Or to make it easy on you, I have put that link in the description on YouTube and on the podcast. So go ahead and get your picks in. They are set up and ready to roll. Now, this is episode 989. We are getting ever closer to episode 1000. And that'll be in the first few weeks of the season. So hopefully you guys are ready. We are now on the three shows per week schedule. Hopefully you are subscribed. If you're not already, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube and on the podcast as well. The Tuesday evening show, the full show, will only be available on the podcast on Wednesday morning. I will have clips from that Tuesday show that will go out on YouTube, etc. So make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast on any of your favorite podcast apps and on the YouTube channel. We would certainly appreciate that. The goal for the YouTube channel, by the way, we're over 6,800 subscribers. We're wanting to get to 7,500. That's the goal. We're trying to make it easy. So just get us to 7,500, and that will help things out for sure. Now, uh, the Bet U.S. College Football Show, by the way, 6-0 and against the spread to start things off. Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. We had four games that we picked. I had FAU covering seven against Charlotte, and they most certainly did. And I had uh, North Texas covering a pick against UTEP, and they definitely covered that. 31-13, to I believe, was the final. But we'll, we'll get into all that. Let's start things off with what we're going to do each and every week, and that would be this. Uh, we have a top five for multiple different metrics here, uh, multiple different things. The first one is the top five most unlikely wins. So that is, you know, by post-game win expectancy. Now, I'll go on and pull it up on the screen here. Post-game win expectancy this week. There was nobody that had a lower post-game win expectancy than 50%. So, honestly, it was 55%. But that number one there was Northwestern. 55% win expectancy against Nebraska. They come away with a 31-28 to win. We will obviously discuss that here momentarily. And then number two was Western Kentucky. Facing off against Austin P. in FCS school, they won that game 38-27. to uh, And there were some questionable moments. The first game... Uh, Sands, Zach Kitley, Sands, Bailey Zappi, etc. did not go nearly as well as I think everybody assumed that it would, especially with the win total sitting at around 8.5. They did get the dub, though, and that's all you need, really. Other than that, uh, the next closest one, I think Nevada and FAU at 85%. Everything else was, you know, North Carolina 96%, 99% for Illinois, 99 for Utah State, etc. It's... And this was what it was supposed to be. And just some some teams that dominated on the scoreboard and in the stat sheet. Uh, just quite a bit. Uh, as far as the next one, the top five most dominant wins, you can still see it here. That's post-game win expectancy. There, There's going to be a lot more games each week, so this will make more sense to do a top five. Uh, but here, I, you've got Vanderbilt over Hawaii. That was, uh, what, 63-10, to 10, something like that, whatever. Oh, 60, yeah, 63-10. to 10. 
Uh, then you had UNLV against Idaho State, 52 to 21. You had Florida State against Duquesne, 47 to 7. North Texas against UTEP, that one was 31 to 13. There were certainly questionable moments, but that one, yeah, North Texas, a 100% win expectancy rate after that ball game. Illinois against Wyoming was 99, and so forth and so on. Uh, it was just a dominant weekend for the majority of the better teams, and there were no questionable calls. No questionable anything. So I was excited to be able to see real-life football going on on my TV screen and on my iPad. Uh, there were a couple of them that I had to, you know, go back and forth and whatnot. But it was, uh, it was a good time. The top five most exciting games. Now, we did talk about this the other day as far as, uh, you know, which ones I thought there would be the most big plays, which ones I believed would be the closest games, etc. I said FAU and Charlotte would have the most big plays. I don't think I was necessarily wrong there. And I thought that the closest game would actually be um, UTEP and North Texas. That one ended up not being close at all, 31-13, to 13, as I mentioned before. But I'll bring up on the screen here the excitement index uh, via gameonpaper.com, which, by the way, if you are an advanced stats guy and you want to see exactly how valuable certain plays are, etc., that is going to be you go to every single week. Those guys do a fantastic job. It is a much more advanced box score than what you're going to get over at ESPN. I choose to look at both of them because this one doesn't have everything, but it's got almost everything that you could possibly need to see who actually performed the best in certain games. So in this spot, as far as excitement goes, and that is based on win probabilities, jumping back and forth, etc. Your number one here, Charlotte at Florida Atlantic. It was a 10.1. Uh, the big plays that went back and forth, especially early, kind of swung momentum certain ways. And then, of course, once Chris Reynolds went out, which we will talk about, once he went out, eh, that was kind of all she wrote, right? So, big issues there for uh, Charlotte. Now, he did come back in the ball game, but by that point, Florida Atlantic had rung up 33 straight. So, either way, they are number one. Number two here is Nebraska and Northwestern, 8.31 there. And following close behind was North Texas at UTEP, which I mentioned before. Early in this game, I mean, it was 14 to 13 at the half. So, of course, it was exciting. It got a little out of hand later. But, uh, but you could see Hardison, certainly a gunslinger. There were definitely opportunities for UTEP to be in that game. And, uh, and that is why the excitement rating was, was up on that one. Uh, the fourth one here is UConn and Utah State. Uh, you know, 5.61 here. Hey, UConn was up 14 to nothing. You know, obviously, uh, a comeback from Utah State made this, you know, it, it was an 11-point uh, final. Eh, you know. And then Nevada and New Mexico State, that one was close, but there was nothing happening in that ball game. So that one got a 4.7. So that's your top five on that one. But, yeah, very interesting stuff from Week 0 for sure. But this is going to take us into... The recap section of the show. Now, let me go ahead and write down our times here because we want to make sure that we keep up with these so that we can cut and paste and whatnot. And, and they will be much more in-depth as we get further into the season. We're going to start off with Nebraska and Northwestern. Of course, this one over in Ireland. Uh, I've got the basic stats that you would need to know up on the screen here. And the postgame win expectancy, as I mentioned before, 55% for Northwestern. And 45% for Nebraska in a 31 to 28 game. Uh, the onside kick by Nebraska when they were up 28 to 17 early, early in the second half. Why would you do it? I mean, this is what everybody's laughing about right now, right? It's Scott Frost, everybody knew that you had to come out with a win in week one or in week zero. And this is what they put up there. Now, if you look at the offensive yards per play, Nebraska had 8.44 in this game. The issue is, uh, let's see if we can move over, over here. The scrimmage plays, only 62 for Nebraska, 80 for Northwestern. Uh, that, that ain't going to cut it. I mean, 8.44 is really good. The issue is the EPA here, the total EPA, 0.41, and for Northwestern, it was 15.51. So the plays were much more... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Northwestern just was more efficient and more effective 
in the way that they played this game. It was just insane to watch because I, I almost couldn't believe it. Uh, Nebraska gave up two 11-point leads here, and that is mind-blowing stuff. Just mind-blowing. Uh, Nebraska did have three turnovers. Obviously, that's important. Uh, Nebraska had a better third-down conversion rate. They tried to go for it once on fourth down. Didn't get it. Uh, Northwestern did get that one. Scoring opportunities. Nebraska had more scoring opportunities, but they had less points per scoring opportunity. I mean, who'd have thunk it? Uh, they had worse field position. Their, their field position in this game, they averaged starting at their own 18-yard line. Hidden yardage. Pat Fitzgerald does it again. Like, he just continues, even years for the Wildcats, they continue to be good over and over and over again. I mean, it's just mind-blowing stuff. Ryan Holinsky really surprised me in this ball game because ever since he got to Evanston, he has not been a good quarterback. And maybe there's something to the idea of developing and learning under the system. Uh, Mike Bajakian, uh, I hope I say that right, that's the offensive coordinator for Northwestern. He uh, is still relatively new. He was the Boston College offensive coordinator when Steve Adazio was there. And he had some interesting thoughts, interesting things that he was doing as the OC early on. But I think once you get the system set, maybe that's okay. Their offensive line was a little bit better than I assumed that they would be. But at the same time, there's not a lot of depth on Nebraska's defensive line. I really thought Mathis was going to be more of an impact player than he showed in, in this first game. Um, but man, I mean, just just not good. All, all over the place. Um, looking, looking at expected turnovers, etc. Uh, turnover luck over here. And let's see if you can see it on the screen here. Uh, turnover luck as far as points go. I mean, for Nebraska, it was negative 7.8 points, which, of course, in turn means 7.8 points for Northwestern that they maybe would not have had if it had not been for the turnovers. Uh, it, it's, it felt that onside kick is the biggest thing. That's what everybody really wants to talk about. And I don't think it's that. I don't think that's the big thing that you can take from it. I, I think that I heard the Cover 3 podcast guys talking about this. It felt like last year... Everybody pointed at special teams. It, special teams. That's the reason why Nebraska's not winning ball games. It, okay, so now this offseason, they go out and they get a special teams coach, and they're working on things, and they started looking pretty good. They were actually fielding punts well. They were actually punting the ball well. Uh, the extra points were good. Kickoffs were good, etc. Everything was good. And then they decide to go and do an onside kick, because they're already up by 11, so it's not like if you give up a short field, it's going to uh, cost you the entire lead in one series. But at the same time, there was no reason to do it. Northwestern had already shown that they were not going to be big play guys. They, they, they were going to have to work for their yardage. And it's not that they couldn't get the yardage, obviously, as we, as we see. They had 527 yards on offense. But in order for them to get down the field... It was going to take a lot more effort. And when you shorten the field for them, I mean, it just gives them more opportunity. So I did not fully understand why you would do that at that point. And I don't think anybody did. Even Scott Frost came out afterwards and said, hey, that was on me. That was a bad decision. But I think that's what Nebraska fans are irritated about because it's always bad decisions. Whether it's from Scott Frost or it's from the players. You brought in a whole slew of new players this year and you're still going through the same issues that you were before. I don't know how you continue to do that. I mean, it's it's really mind-blowing stuff. Um, how about this one? Scott Frost throwing his offensive coordinator under the bus in the postgame. It's inexcusable. It's absurd. It is... I, I don't even know what to say. Like, if I'm Mark Whipple, I am really irritated. Now, there is part of me that thinks that maybe some of this has to do with the fact that... Scott Frost still considers himself a part of that offensive staff. But he said that I think that uh, the offensive staff is going to learn in this conference, you have to be more creative. But the issue necessarily isn't creativity. It's just making adjustments. Just, you know, normal adjustments that you would make at halftime of a game once you realize what another team is capable of doing. And yeah, it looked like they made adjustments early on by coming out and scoring 14 straight points. And part of that was, you know, from Northwestern, uh, from a Northwestern turnover. But I, 
my gosh, it looked like they were doing the same thing over and over again. And once Northwestern figured them out, it was game, set, match. Uh, the, the drive at the end of the game uh, was just brutal. Where all they did was run the ball and Nebraska could not stop them. It's not the offense's fault for Nebraska. The issue is this Northwestern team does not have nearly as much talent as that Nebraska team, and they put up 527 yards of offense and 31 points. The Northwestern last year went 3-9, and nine, the same as Nebraska, but Northwestern was not in hardly any of those games that they lost. I mean, this was really mind-blowing stuff, but it, it does, you know, it, one, uh, let me go ahead and give some props over to Northwestern. Ryan Holinsky looked good. I said it earlier, but I'm going to say it again. Ryan Holinsky looked really, really good in this ball game. I mean, he was uh, other level, absolutely other level kind of player. Um, you know, 313 yards and two touchdowns, uh, like 81 xQBR, like <laughs> 9.48 yards per play. Like Holinsky was good. He was good. Evan Hall, 22 carries, 119 yards. Uh, Cam Porter, 19 carries, 94 yards, one touchdown. He did have one fumble. Um, the running attack looks good. The offensive line looks pretty good for Northwestern. Like, this is awesome. Before Nebraska, two double-digit leads given up in this game. And I don't know where you go from here. I really don't. Like, I, it's only the first game. You try not to overreact too much. But the buyout for Scott Frost drops from $15 million to $7.5 million on October 1st. Yeah, they're going to win the next couple of ball games. Once Oklahoma comes in there, can you get a win over Oklahoma? I mean, I know it's at home, but at this point, I don't know. I, I really have no idea. So, just mind-blowing stuff out of Dublin, Ireland, for sure. Moving on from there, Utah State 31, UConn 20. UConn opened up 14 to nothing, and I will tell you, I was... Flummoxed. I was perplexed. I, what's a good word for this? Because I did not see this coming at all. Like, I had no idea what to expect from this. Utah State, huge plays last year. I expected, you know, a few things early, and they did. They came out in the second quarter and put up 24 points unanswered. Uh, it was 24 to 14 at the half. But, man, I, I looked at this, and I, I said, man, I know that you don't necessarily know what to expect out of UConn, but this lets me know that Utah State is not a great football team for sure this season. Uh, and obviously, yeah, you were going to have some regression this year because Utah State was not great last year, and yet they still won 11 ball games, and they got lucky in some games. Maybe they should not have won, but they ended up coming out with the W at the end of the day. This go-round, they did have more offensive yards per play, which 7.15 yards per play is good. Not going to say that. Logan Bonner was 20 out of 29. Uh, he had 281 yards, three touchdowns. The running back for Utah State, Calvin Taylor, uh, excuse me, Calvin Tyler, had uh, 33 carries for 161 yards. That's another interesting part of this. Blake Anderson does not like to run the ball, and they had 54 rushes against UConn. Like, it's not like they were blowing them out. It's not like they were trying to run the clock. But 54 rushes, and they were successful. Uh, the backup running back had a great day as well. So, the thing that uh, concerns me a little bit is UConn put up 6.39 yards per play. Now, it was only 364 total yards because Utah State kind of took over in the second quarter. And then, it just it, this was still a, a ball game, by the way. It was 24 to 20 in the fourth quarter, like 10 minutes left in this game. But, I mean, the Jim Mora experiment, uh, so far, so good. Like, this team is still fighting. And that's not what you could say about the Randy, Ed, uh, Randy Edsel bunch, for sure. So, uh, looking at it, I mean, Utah State had eight scoring opportunities. They put up 3.88 points per scoring opportunity. Uh, both of them about the same field position, etc. cetera. Uh, but I saw good signs from UConn. They tried. Like, they played hard for Jim Mora. And that's not what you could say for the last bunch. Utah State, I think they will get better as they go along. I don't think that they were trying to show a whole lot in this ballgame. They do have Alabama coming up next. And, of course, once they get into Mountain West play, I think we'll see a whole different team. But, man, you want to talk about jumping from uh, out of the frying pan into the fire kind of kind of situation here? Going from playing UConn to going into Tuscaloosa, that's a little bit of a different animal. 
I will I will certainly say that. That is a different beast. So uh, Utah State was good, though. Uh, you know, they, they get some, some good plays. Their win probability was up basically the entire game, even when they get down uh, 14 to nothing. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the offensive EPA for Utah State was 14.56. For UConn, it was 1.66. It was, you know, UConn actually looked like a competent football team, and we haven't seen that in quite some time, for sure, on that one. Now, we're going to move over to... Uh, da, 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 da. You know, we're going to move to Illinois, but first, uh, let's check out some ads. Let's check out some things you should know about. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. Craig Bowl. What are you doing to me, man? And I know it's not his fault, but Wyoming looked absolutely inept in this game on Saturday against Illinois. Uh, the Fighting Illini win 38-6. to They didn't really have to do a whole lot. They missed some field goals. The game really shouldn't have even been this close. Uh, as, as multiple people have said, and I think Parker was the first to say it over at Stats of War, which, by the way, you can catch him with me on the BetUS College Football Show. Uh, I, I look at this, and I think that Wyoming does not even have a two deep full of legit FBS players. Like Parker said at first, but when you watch this game, it was not what you expect from a Craig Bowl offense, for sure. It, it's just painful to watch. Uh, we'll move it over to the stats here. And, oh, I mean, brother, that is... It, for Illinois, uh, they had an advantage in offensive yards per play, 6.45 to 4.35. They had more total yards, 490 to only 213 for Wyoming. Uh, they had zero turnovers to three for Wyoming. They converted 43.75% uh, of their third downs, which is not great, but Wyoming only converted 8.33%. I mean, it's not good. Uh, fourth down tries, you know, Illinois went for it twice and got one of them. Uh, Wyoming only tried once and did not get it. Uh, after that, I mean, the field position, like Illinois averaged starting on their own 39-yard line. Uh, Wyoming basically a touchback every time. Uh, just just brutal. Uh, when you look at the actual stats as far as, like, expected points, etc. I mean, this was just, I mean, about as brutal as you could get. Just as brutal as you, I, I don't even know how to, how to put this into context, uh, Wyoming is terrible. I mean, they are just a really, really bad team. Um, when you look at when you look at the players here, I I mean, the quarterback was, what, 5 out of 20 passing? I mean, it's just not good. Not good at all. Um, you know, Tommy DeVito, I will, let's, let's talk good things about Illinois now. Illinois, Tommy DeVito looked good in this offense, and they, they looked fun. Like, this was a fun, fun ball club. Uh, I like what Barry Lunny's doing on offense right now. I mean, this is, go like, really, really awesome. Uh, Chase Brown, by the way, 19 carries for 151 yards, two touchdowns. He did have some catches as well. Tommy DeVito was 27 out of 37 passing for 194 yards and two touchdowns. And I will tell you this about Illinois. They did not show anything in this ballgame. There was nothing out of the ordinary they just lined up and whipped the guys across from them. Second half, you could really tell the difference in the offensive line for Illinois and the defensive line for Wyoming uh, because Illinois outweighed them by an average of like 50-something pounds per player. Just an absolute beatdown of those players. And, I mean, Illinois did what they were supposed to do. Wyoming looks like they are going to be in some serious trouble. All those players that they lost to the transfer portal, uh, that's rough. 
I mean, this this game against Tulsa next week, the line is already jumping. Uh, we'll probably talk about it on uh, the Bet US College Football Show. But man, just brutal, just brutal. Uh, Wyoming, uh, we wish you the best. We hope that you guys develop well. But this is going to be a rough year for sure. Illinois looks like fun. This could be a surprise team. You guys know how much I enjoy Brett Bielema. Uh, he looks like he's going to have fun with this bunch for sure. That will move us on over. And we are going to talk about... Da, 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 write my time down. FAU 43, Charlotte 13. Nikosi Perry in this one, 16 out of 22, 256 yards and one touchdown. Uh, you did have uh, the running back, uh, McCommon, um, 14 carries and 118 yards, one touchdown here. Uh, Chris Reynolds went out for Charlotte. He is the quarterback for the 49ers. He went out in this game in the second quarter, and that is when it all happened. I mean, it was brutal from that point on. 33 straight points for FAU, and this game got out of hand quick. When the backup quarterback for Charlotte came in, I want to say it was Fisher. Uh, I might be wrong about that. You guys correct me in the comments. But once he came in, I just did not gel, and that just inexcusable uh, pass interception for a touchdown return in, at the end of the second quarter uh, just blew this game open. I mean, there was there was nothing that they could do from that point on. Uh, looking at the overall stats, I mean, yards per play, uh, basically everything was favoring FAU in this spot. And, I mean, they owned it. They absolutely did. They had one defensive touchdown. That certainly changed things around. Uh, they were 100% on fourth down. They tried it twice, and they got both of them. Third down tries, they were 8 of 16, while Charlotte, on the other hand, got only 18% of theirs. Uh, they tried 11 third downs. Charlotte had two turnovers. Uh FAU, 484 total yards to only 336 at 7.01 yards per play to only 6.59. I say only 6.59. That's still pretty good. It's just that they didn't have the ball as much. It's <laughs> the only 336 total yards here. Uh, but looking over at game on paper, I mean, just uh, not what you would have expected from Charlotte. You know, there were a lot of people that were talking about FAU secondary and them being new and not super experienced, and some of the guys are a little bit shorter. But I will tell you that they kind of held their own in this game. That, yes, they gave up a big play early to Grant Dubos very early. And there were certainly some plays that they would wish that they had back, but they they didn't really break much. They didn't give up huge burner plays over and over again like I was worried that they might. And FAU just dominated this game. Uh, I mean, absolutely dominated the game. When you look at it, uh, successful plays, FAU had 21. Charlotte only had 14. Uh, when rushing, FAU had 11 successful plays rushing and only three to Charlotte. I, I mean, just really, really crazy when you look at it. Uh, the total EPA here, you know, for uh, for offensive EPA, 2.84 for FAU, and it was negative 7.72 for Charlotte. I mean, this was really... Not what you would have expected out of a Will Healy team early on. Yet you would hope that they would be a little bit better. Uh, but is what it is. Uh, it's Foster, by the way, not Fisher. That's the <laughs> that's the backup quarterback's name, uh, James Foster. So, yeah, uh, just brutal, not good, et cetera, et cetera. So just uh, just tough. Uh, Tucker and Dubose, et cetera. Uh, Bird was was also you know decent, but oh. Charlotte just got demolished in this game. And, uh, and if you were watching the BetUS College Football Show, you would have heard me give this out last week for sure. So, yeah, that was a rough, rough game for Charlotte in that one. We will – let's hit uh, let's hit one more, another Conference USA game here. North Texas 31 and UTEP 13. And pulling up the stats here on this one, uh, watch this one all the way through. The Sun Bowl – it didn't look sold out, but it looked full. It was a full celebration of the 915. It was a good time for everybody that went, it appeared. And in that first half, it was 14 to 13 North Texas at the half. And it was jumping. They were having themselves a time. Hey, Hardison was slinging that thing. I mean, it, it looked good in the first half. Uh, some of the notes I wrote down here 
So Gavin Hardison, 13 out of 26 in the first half for 206 yards and one touchdown. And most of the receiving yards, I want to say it was 190 plus, went to those two receivers that uh, I think it was Foster and... Da, 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 da. Here, you know what? I can pull this up and take a look uh, before we actually jump into the thing. Uh, no, Flores and Smith. So, Ronaldo Flores and Tyron Smith here. They had themselves a first half. They really did. 190-plus yards in that first half. Uh, but Gavin Hardison in the second half, 8 out of 22 for 87 yards. Like, just could not get it going. Once Phil Bennett's defense figured them out in the second half, that was all she wrote. Because North Texas was able to put up just enough points. Uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, <laughs> the tight end for him, uh, came in and, and played really, really well. Austin On was serviceable. He did lean on the tight end a little bit. Uh, the tight end led in receptions here. Uh, did have a touchdown as well. Um, but that just just the, uh, the points that they scored, 31 points, that was plenty good enough for Phil Bennett's defense to be able to put the clamps down on UTEP. Uh, that was the biggest thing. And we're going to pull up these uh, stats here. But the biggest thing was, in the offseason, how, how much was Jacob Cowing worth? Uh, how, how much were the other guys worth that they lost? Uh, Jacob Cowing was a top 10 uh, predicted points added player. Like, he was insanely valuable. He's one of those guys that Hardison could just throw the ball up, and he would make something happen out of it. And that was kind of what their offense was for a large part of last season. This go round, uh, yeah, you, you can kind of see they had trouble finishing drives for sure. Uh, let's talk about the things that UTEP was, you know, had the advantage in, and that would be yards per play, seven point four three to only six point eight. Again, only six point eight. It used to be that these things were like four yards per play, but regardless, uh, but only three hundred ninety four total yards. They both both teams had a turnover. Only thirty eight percent, thirty nine percent on third down. Uh, fourth down, they were only two out of six on that. They went for it six times on fourth down. Uh, they did have seven scoring opportunities and only got 1.86 points per scoring opportunity. No defensive touchdowns, et cetera, for either team. Both teams started drives or averaged starting drives on their own 23 here. Uh, but UTEP, just tons of missed opportunities. They got the ball down there multiple times in scoring position and came away with very few points tried field goals, et cetera. It was just rough, just rough. I had North Texas at a pick em. Uh Line closed at one and a half. So, you know, either way, North Texas, I thought, would be the significantly better team, and they were uh, at the end of the day. They were the more competent team. They made less mistakes, et cetera, which to me means that they are the better overall team. But, man, this was uh, this was rough. As far as the most important plays, um, yeah, let's see. Da, 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 da. Second quarter, uh, oh yeah, the fumble uh, that was recovered by uh, UTEP's uh, defensive end, uh, that was a big one. Uh, I mean, there's just there's a there's several several big plays. The pass complete to Tommy Bush for seven yards for a touchdown in the third quarter. There was a touchdown thrown on like a little wheel route. It was a little uh, bootleg, it looked like, where it looked like everybody on the team was already at least three to five yards down the field, and I don't know how they didn't throw a flag for an eligible receiver downfield or lineman downfield or anything like that, uh, but they gave him the touchdown for sure. Uh, once, I mean, all you needed was a few scores, and Phil Bennett's defense was going to be pretty good in this situation, but it's a good start for North Texas. It is definitely a good start for North Texas uh, because they, I mean, they were rolling at the end of last season. UTEP has got to figure out a few things. And you got to figure out the field goal kicking stuff. You got to just a lot of question marks around UTEP. Defense was still okay, just not great. Just not great. All right, uh, let's hit a few more ads and then we will hit a few more on the backside. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures, and you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? 
<laughs> well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. And if you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right. So, the next one on the board here, Nevada 23, New Mexico State 12. A lot of people were riding on New Mexico State because of the coaching mismatch, etc. And I said on on the U.S. College Football Show to be careful with this because that New Mexico State roster is awful. And I understand that Nevada's is not great, but you could see a significant talent advantage even with all the players that the Wolfpack lost, right? You could see it. I mean, it was just clear as day. We'll go ahead and look at some of the stats here. Uh, Looking at offensive yards per play, New Mexico State, 5.58 to only 4.3 for Nevada. I mean, that's just brutal. 318 uh, total yards on offense to only 288. Uh, But look, they could not figure out the quarterback position for New Mexico State. Uh, Gavin Freaks was the freshman quarterback that came in and looked pretty good, but they don't have any receivers. They couldn't catch the ball. It was brutal to watch. Five turnovers for the Aggies to only one for Nevada. And that was the that was the difference in the ball game. Uh third down tries, it was 47% to 41%, whatever. Uh fourth down tries, blah. Scoring opportunities, both of them had six. The question or the difference there is Nevada was able to finish more drives. 3.83 points per scoring opportunity to only 1.67 for New Mexico State. Um the field position wasn't vastly different. I mean, it, an average of four yards better for Nevada. They started on their own 31, usually, uh, to the 27 for New Mexico State. Uh, but looking at this, you know, Nevada's passing game, just brutal. 14 out of 23 for only 78 yards between Nate Cox and Shane Illing, uh, Illingsworth. Um, that ain't going to cut it in the Mountain West. It'll cut it against New Mexico State. But, geez, uh, they did have 45 rushes for 179 yards. That's where you saw the talent advantage. But for Nevada, uh, I have been screaming from the mountaintops to take the under ever since that thing was at, like, 5.5. I bet it at 5.5. I bet it at 5. I bet it at 4.5. Uh, I did not bet it at 4. But that's where it sits currently, from what I understand. I, I don't know that you can get it anymore. But, man, this is a team that a lot of people are going to be uh, betting against. But New Mexico State, this is what they're going to do. They're going to shorten games. They're going to run as much clock as humanly possible, do their best to keep themselves in ball games. But it is going to take a long time, a very long time, for them to get any semblance of an FBS roster. Uh, but Jerry Kill knows what he's doing. Like he's, he's a good head coach, and he will build that thing up the right way, uh, from what I can tell. Anyway. All right, last game that we are going to hit on here. The Vanderbilt Commodores 63 to 10 over Hawaii and goodness gracious. Uh, this one started out seven to nothing Hawaii. And I immediately thought, well, this is obviously why I did not want to bet on the Commodores. Because it's still Vanderbilt at the end of the day. But man, after that, it was all she wrote. I mean, this thing was about as brutal as you can get. Uh the Vanderbilt defense still not great, but they didn't allow Hawaii to finish a bunch of drives. So that's certainly one thing, I guess you could say. Uh, looking at this, offensive yards per play, 9.3 for the Commodores to only 5.74. Uh, total yards, 623 to 425. Vandy didn't have any turnovers to three for Hawaii. Uh, Vandy was better on third down, 45% to 31%. They went for it five times on fourth down, and they got one of them, which was better than the 0 of 4 that Hawaii did. (laughs) Vandy had nine scoring opportunities, and they got 4.67 points per scoring opportunity. Uh, Hawaii, on the other hand, seven scoring opportunities for only 1.43 points per drive. For those that don't know what a scoring opportunity is, that is a drive where you get a first down inside the opponent's 40-yard line. That, That just means it's a good drive and how how well did you do? Vandy got two 
defensive and special teams touchdowns here. Uh, the field position, Vanderbilt, nine yards better. Average uh, starting field position in this one, thirty their own 33 to uh, Hawaii's own 24. And this was just a beatdown of epic proportions. I don't think that this says anything necessarily about Vanderbilt. I think what it tells you is Hawaii is going to be really, really bad this year. Uh, I mean, it's just... I don't even know what to what to make of it. They they did some fun things on offense. They tried out a few different things, um, but man, Hawaii is just yeah. Uh, they they they're small. They look small. They look confused. It's they don't really have a full FBS roster right now. And Timmy Chang is going to have his hands full. But at least the administration is giving him the time needed to be able to turn this thing around because they know how bad things got under Todd Graham. And they lost everybody. They had some talented players. They got some guys that are going to be starting on two deeps, or that will be on two deeps for Power 5 good football programs. And they did have them at Hawaii. Had the chances, had the opportunities, and yet here we are. But uh, regardless, Vanderbilt, this is the story. 63 points. I mean, just looked awesome for Clark Lee. Uh, Quarterback Mike Wright led the attack. Uh, He led the rushing attack. Uh, They had over 400 yards rushing in this game. Nine yards per carry. They had five rushing touchdowns here. Uh, the passing game wasn't a lot to write home about, but they were able to at least turn a few good plays. I will say that. Uh, this is good for Clark Lee. I mean, just great for Vanderbilt. You don't get to see this very often for the Commodores, and yet here we are. It was good stuff. Good stuff for Vandy. Good stuff for the SEC. Uh, Hawaii, just ooh, rough stuff. Rough stuff. Uh, Let's hit on a few notes before we get out of here. Uh, We do have, of course, a show coming out on podcast on Wednesday morning. And then, of course, a Thursday preview show heading into week one, Labor Day weekend, etc. Again, if you've not already, go over to winningcureseverything.com. Enter the contest. It's right there at the top of the page. Or there's a link in the description. Uh, Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, etc. And subscribe to the BetUS College Football Show. The link is in the description for that one as well. Uh, The show, by the way, powered by BetUS. That's right. We will, and if you're watching on the YouTube, you will be able to see that here. But uh, but yes, they are the exclusive sportsbook partner for us, the exclusive sports betting partner for us for this season. We could not be more excited to have them join the fold. I am glad that they are here, and I will point you their direction so that you can do all your sports betting over there. So, uh, North Carolina won fifty six to twenty four over Florida A and M. There was a chance on Friday that this game might not happen because Florida A&M was down 20-something players due to academic eligibility issues. And yet, Florida A&M had this at a 35-24 to game late in the third quarter. Now, North Carolina scored 21 unanswered in the fourth. But, man, uh, that was that was interesting to see what was going on there. Drake May, by the way, looks really, really good at quarterback. Uh, the defense, first game for Gene Chizik. I don't know if they were trying to keep things as vanilla as possible, uh, if maybe they didn't want to put anything on tape for App State this coming week, but whew, uh, questionable for sure. Florida State and Duquesne, 47-7. to The Seminoles get the win there. And this one was just mired by uh, rain delays and everything else. And Florida State ended up having 400-plus yards rushing. Jordan Travis was fine. Uh, they had uh, one of their stud receivers that they are expecting to be a stud anyway, uh, go out with an injury early. And from that point on, it was just, hey, let's just not get anybody hurt. Let's go out here and dominate the way that we're supposed to dominate. Uh, first time that Florida State has started 1-0 since, I believe, 2016. Uh, very interesting. So, Western Kentucky 38-21, to or excuse me, 38-27 to over Austin P. Uh, mentioned that one earlier in the most unlikely wins, which it was still a likely win. The postgame win expectancy was 72% for Western Kentucky. But, uh but this was a weird one. Uh, Austin P gave them all that they wanted. Western Kentucky's got some things to figure out, for sure. Uh, that quarterback did not look great. The offensive line did not look great. They got some things to work out on the offensive side of the ball and on defense. I mean, they gave up 27 to Austin P. They should have dominated this ball game, but still questions there. UNLV, 52-21 to over Idaho State. The wide receiver, uh, Ricky White, the transfer from Michigan State. Whew, eight catches like 180-some-odd a, a yards or whatever it was. I mean, it's just, he looks like he could be a dominant player 
in the Mountain West. So UNLV has got somebody that they can fling the ball to. Uh, he is going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. UNLV finally has a playmaker, and that could be interesting this year, for sure. So keep an eye out on the Rebels over there. Uh, news as far as starting quarterbacks, etc. Texas A&M Haynes King is going to be their starter. I think we all kind of expected that. He is the longest tenured Inside of Jimbo's offense, everybody knows how long that playbook is, et cetera. It takes a long time to learn. Haynes King was the starter last year before he got hurt. Now he's back. Everything should be good. We'll see what this team looks like with Haynes King. Don't forget, they do have Max Johnson as the backup. So if things do not go well with King, don't be surprised to see Johnson make, or Johnson make an appearance. Auburn has named TJ Finley their starting quarterback. I think we all expected that one. Zach Calzada not doing so great. Robbie Ashford, the quarterback that came in from Oregon, has looked pretty good for them as well. But T.J. Finley understands Hartson's offense the best, etc. cetera. Uh, looks like it's going to be him again. So we'll we'll see in the second year under Brian Harson what T.J. Finley can do. And finally, and we'll, uh, we'll write a time down on this one, Jim Harbaugh decided to name two quarterbacks as his starters. And I found this very interesting and a lot of fun. And the reason I found this interesting and fun was because he named Cade McNamara the starter for week one. He named J.J. McCarthy the starter for week two. Uh, One is playing against Colorado State. The other one's playing against Hawaii. And effectively, I think he did this to tell everybody to quit asking him who's going to be the starter. I think they don't know who's going to be the starter. Uh, Nick Saban used to do this all the time, right, where they would have multiple guys listed as the starter, and you would get to week one. Remember, he famously did this with Blake Barnett and Jalen Hurts, etc. Blake Barnett came in, looked like a deer in headlights. Jalen Hurts took over the offense against USC. The rest was history. Uh, But you will see this over and over again. He did it with Jalen Hurts and Tua uh, early in that season, in 2018, I guess it was, whatever. Like, this is a... This is a weird tactic. I think he just wants to see J.J. McCarthy have some starting experience. Give him an opportunity to see what he looks like when he is the guy with the ones all week, etc. He didn't have to say anything about this. He didn't have to come out and say anything. I think this was his way of telling the media, hey, we're going to give both guys an opportunity, and we don't think that Colorado State or Hawaii can play with us. So we're just going to give both of them a shot to be the starter heading into those weeks. I don't just like the idea. I think this is a pretty smart idea when you think about it to give both of them equal opportunity in a different kind of setting. Because inside the practice field setting, it's different when you're running with the ones as opposed to the twos. So you want to see exactly what they look like in those situations. And yes, you're already doing it in fall camp. We get that. But now you're heading into game week. Game week, a little bit different setup. I'm curious. I'm curious what this is going to look like. I want to see... J.J. McCarthy. I think he has a higher ceiling than Cade McNamara. But the other side of this is that McNamara, of course, the veteran presence, less likely to make the mistake that is going to hurt you. Everybody remembers J.J. McCarthy making the mistake against Michigan State last year. All in all, I still think he has a way higher ceiling, a way more explosive player. But is he going to do that thing that can cost you the game? That's where the question comes from. So, I think it's a good idea for Harbaugh. I think Michigan is doing the right thing here. Uh, so we'll we'll see. We'll see as we go further along. All right, this thing went a little bit longer than I anticipated it being. But hey, it's week zero. I'm excited. It's going to be a good week. Week one coming up. Uh, Tuesday show, Tuesday night, of course, the Wednesday morning podcast. Going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of different things that we're going to hit on. Along with that, the Bet US College Football Show. Tuesday and Wednesday, both 1 p.m. Eastern time. Make sure that you tune in, get some good picks, etc. We're going to have some really good analysis. Parker Fleming, Kyle Hunter, and then, of course, I'm on there as well. Uh, Nothing from me is nearly as good as what those guys provide. But regardless, you guys go ahead and subscribe over there. Subscribe on this channel. Share the show out. Tell your friends. Jump into the comments. I'd love to hear everything. With that said, we're going to get out of here. You guys take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully... All of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. 
Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.